Hello and welcome. Today's lecture is going to focus on a paper by Jennifer Doliak and Benjamin Hansen called The Unintended Consequences of Ban the Box, Statistical Discrimination and Employment Outcomes When Criminal Histories Are Hidden. So what this paper is going to do is it's going to look at the effect of a series of policies passed by a variety of states and municipalities, mostly in the mid-2000s, aimed at reducing employment discrimination against workers with recent criminal histories. Now, the reason that this is important is because workers with recent criminal records face very high rates of unemployment and very high rates of discrimination in the labor market. One study in 2008 found that the unemployment rate among the recently incarcerated was about 30%, which was about um, five times higher than the average unemployment rate during two, in 2008, and is actually higher than the unemployment rate on average during the Great Depression. So what this means is it's very difficult for the recently incarcerated to find jobs, and that can potentially have negative outcomes not just for the recently incarcerated, but also for other members of society. Because if it's difficult to find a job when you leave prison, that might make it more likely that people who have criminal records are going to reoffend. In other words, if you can't find employment, that make, might make it more likely that you'll engage in crime in the future. And that might be especially true if the sort of discrimination faced by um, those with recent criminal records is a blanket rejection of applicants with criminal records. In other words, you might be especially disincentivized to try to avoid crime in the future if employers won't give you any credit for doing things like trying to increase your level of education or um, maintaining sobriety or other sorts of, of decisions that an employee can make, a potential employee can make to distance themselves from the criminal past. So the way that these policies, these ban the box policies attempt to deal with that is by making it a little bit more difficult for employers to learn about the criminal histories of job applicants. Essentially what they do is they bar employers from directly asking in an initial resume screening process about criminal histories. In other words, they don't allow employers to include a box on the employment application that says, have you ever been convicted of a felony? And if so, explain. Instead, if employers want to learn about the criminal records of their potential applicants, they have to run a criminal background check, which is a little bit more costly and time consuming than would normally be done early on in the resume screening process. And so the hope is, as a result, employers are not going to learn about criminal records as the first thing they know about an applicant, but rather as something they'll learn later on in the process when they have more context for a person's past. And the hope of these policies is that as a result, you'll see both more people with criminal records be employed and also greater incentives for those with criminal records to invest in um, job training or education or sobriety or other things that might make them more desirable as employees. So the potential problem with these policies and the problem that's, that is discussed in this paper is that if employers can't directly observe whether a potential employee has a criminal record, they might try to infer that from other information about the employee. So for example, if you're young, if you're a man, if you don't have a college degree, and if you're a racial minority, employers might believe that you have a higher likelihood of having a criminal record than do other applicants. So as you can see here, there are large disparities by race in the United States and likelihood of being incarcerated, with black men and women about eight times as likely as white men and women to experience incarceration, and Hispanic men and women being about twice as likely as white men and women to experience incarceration. I should mention these disparities are fairly similar by gender, but because men have such higher incarceration rates than women, likelihood of incarceration is much higher for men of all races than it is for women. Now, as a result of this, we might think that the effects of a policy like ban the box on employment rates for groups of people who are most likely to experience incarceration, which is to say young, less educated men, and especially young, less educated black and Hispanic men, might be ambiguous. And the reason for this is, on the one hand, these policies are designed to help people with histories of incarceration. So insofar as young black and Hispanic men are more likely than other groups to have histories of incarceration, they might receive benefits from this policy. On the other hand, if we think that employers might statistically discriminate against the groups of workers who are most likely to have criminal histories, the result might be that even if ban the box policies help workers with criminal histories, they might hurt workers who don't have criminal histories but have demographic characteristics that make them the, um, bear the brunt of statistical discrimination. So what this paper is going to do is it's going to compare employment rates of young white, black, and Hispanic men without college degrees 
in areas that did pass ban the box policies to those in areas that didn't to see what effect these policies had on overall employment rates by demographic characteristics. Okay, so in the next series of videos, I'm gonna start by thinking through the theory of statistical discrimination and how it applies in this case. Then we're gonna think about the strategy used by Doliak and Hansen to identify the effect of ban the box policies on employment rates of black, white, and Hispanic men without college degrees. We're gonna look at the results that they find, and then we'll, we'll think about some of the implications of this paper.